Good evening and welcome everyone. <clears throat> I've been really looking forward to tonight. The concept is simple tonight, just sit back and relax and watch some videos of some animals from around the Cooks River. To kick off, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Cooks River catchment and pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I think it's, it's quite amazing that Aboriginal people have lived along the Cooks River for more than a thousand generations, not a thousand years, a thousand generations. It's, it's just mind-boggling to imagine that. And the, the river would have changed during that period and there would have been changes in wildlife as well. Some of the animals we're going to look at this evening would have been around then but uh, some wouldn't. Some have come in from overseas, some have come from other parts of Australia. So the, the animals I'm going to show tonight, um, they're mostly ones you'll have seen yourself but the difference is they're being viewed through a big camera lens, so you can see details that you can't see normally. So here's, here's one to kick off. So that was one of the first videos I took uh, nearly three years ago um, with a borrowed camera. I didn't have a proper camera at all. And, and that was, I just sort of realized, wow, you can see stuff you've never seen before. And I, I wanted to go and see what else I could video. And I started taking little videos. And it was shortly after that, I thought, I'm gonna start a Facebook page um, which is what it did, and it's called Cooks River Wildlife. And we set a goal to capture something and share something at least once a week for, for the next year. And I was able to do that, but I thought that after about a year, I'd be running out of stuff. Um, but I, I'm nowhere near running out of stuff because as soon as you photograph you know, one thing, you want to find out more about what you've just noticed. Often I find things... Uh, only once I get back home and look at it on a big screen. I will preface this by saying that I'm not a, an expert in wildlife. I'm not an expert in birds. I started learning about birds just by taking videos of them. And often I would take a video of a bird I've never seen before, go and look it up, and then, you know, I can, it looks like I'm a, an expert <laughs> because I know the name. So let's kick off with a few other things. So this is an Australasian data. I won't say anything more about it, except that I think it was pretty tired when I was filming this. need to be very careful when they're cleaning the a very dark feet. Very long neck. Neck is all stretched down to it. When they extend with it, really long. There we go. This is right next to Illawarra Road, just below the bridge. 
and we reach for the cycle path. And I've seen this same data at that very same spot week after week. I think it's mid morning when I come through and it's um it just finished out feeding and it's drying. So here, here is the, I'm pretty sure is the same data, another week on the same little patch. What I want you to listen for is the sound it makes. This really caught me by surprise. An alien sound. Play it again. <laughs> Isn't that bizarre? I think that's the only noise it makes. But what's interesting about a data is it's a lot of people confuse them with a cormorant. They're different from a cormorant because a you see here, a data's got a very sharp beak, so they catch fish by stabbing them. Whereas a cormorant has a hooked beak, uh, and so it uses a different technique to, to catch them. And I've got a series of photos here uh, from Dave Noble. He's a prolific photographer, takes magnificent photos. Uh, should check out his blog. I'll give you some details on that a bit later. But here, I want to show you this sequence of photos. Here's a great cormorant before it catches a fish. And it catches a fish, I think it's a mullet. And look how big that <laughs> mullet is. It's just enormous. I, if I, how is it going to get that down its throat? But it does. Look at that. It's just incredible. <laughs> it just makes me gag looking at it. And there it's, it's nearly down the hatch. And there it goes all the way down. And it, it straight away starts to take off. It's just incredible how, how, a, how, how their throat can expand to get such a big fish down. And then back to the data, you can see the beak is much sharper. And Dave has captured a similar series of photos with a data. And here you can see it stabbed the fish. Um, the previous one is a mullet. This is a Ludric fish. And there it is. It's got a nasty stab, miserable looking fish. And it gets out of the water to eat it. And here it is, pretty fat. You know, even wider than the mullet. Gets it head head down first. Down the hatch. There it goes. <laughs> Nearly gone. So if you I, I, if you're interested in seeing pictures of uh, local wildlife, stunning pictures like that, um, just search for David Noble blog. He is out and about on his bike nearly every day these days with the with uh, the lockdown and he takes amazing photos nearly every day all right here's another video this shows the movement the, the motion of pelicans when they're trying to catch a fish they put their head back and lunge we didn't catch anything both those times. And it's caught something. Doesn't look like it was very big, but it actually caught something. Nice. <laughs> they do this bizarre motion that I just showed there 
where they they stretch their pouch. I I, I tried to look up online what what they're doing, what it's all about, and I couldn't find anything. But what I think is happening is they're stretching it out just before they go off um, fishing, because they they're doing it just before they they launch off. And I think they're just trying to make their pouch nice and flexible, ready to accommodate a big fish. Now this is on the about my own balcony of a previous house I lived at. And I had set up three water bowls for local birds to feed in, and it became popular with currawongs. Unfortunately, there's no sound with this because I was um, filming it on my phone behind the glass door and um, the sound didn't come out. But what is amazing is the Karawong doesn't just jump into one bowl. It just went up and down to all three bowls. I think it's hilarious. Just sampling each one, and you went up and down and up and down for about 20 minutes. Yeah, pop into that one. <laughs> I wish I could have heard it at this point. It was obviously singing out. And it was around this time that uh, a family of currawongs set up a, a nest just in the gum tree overlooking the balcony. And I like to think it's because they liked the, the bathing facilities that were, were just below them, the drinking supply. Now, this was a blue tongue lizard on there's the second or third story of a block of units. And it only has three legs. And this, this is filmed by Lou de Buseville. And if you, you might not be able to hear it, but listen out for a bit of a scraping noise because it's the scraping sound of his belly against the carpet, but probably because he's only got three legs. But he slowly worked his way down these flights of stairs heading towards the garden. Moving fast. Uh, it can't really hear the scraping noise. But... Just uh, flicking his tongue to sniff out the inside of that unit there and keep moving. I love seeing how <laughs> it just curves around the steps. And he headed out to the garden, made it safely outdoors. <laughs> okay. Ah, so these are not cockatoos, they're little corellas, very similar to cockatoos, but they don't have the sulfur crest. They're a bit red around the eye. What I found is interesting is they like using their beak to bite things. And in this little video, uh, they're just they're all competing just to sort of put their beak on this bit of electrical equipment. And, and I was wondering why they're doing that. Um, but they're very competitive about it. The next one takes over. The go himself. It doesn't take long before another one comes along.
and they, they kept doing this. I found out that um, cockatoos and many other birds need to wear down their beak. The beak keeps growing. And so I think what they're doing is finding these tough bits of steel that are sort of the right size for their beak to, um, to wear it back a bit. Now here are some mullet in the river. This was a, just an incredible Sunday morning where mullet were jumping just every few seconds, um, except where I was putting my camera, it seemed. Um, but eventually I just was patient and eventually a few mullet jumped in front of the camera. And then I had fun slowing it down. Still not, not great vision when it slowed down, but um, it was fun to try. So masked lapwings, I, I love watching them. They're quirky birds, I think. I don't know what this head bobbing is about. It's like it has hiccups. Often see lapwings on um, playing fields and ovals and parks, and more often than not, there are two of them together. I don't know whether they are mating pairs. I'm assuming they are. But uh, if you see one, have a look around, you'll nearly always see another one very nearby. And sometimes they do coordinated movements. They, they might move sideways together or tilt their heads together. They're quite quirky. They don't have the most attractive noise, you probably know the noise. This is a juvenile magpie just filmed at my back door, front door, and having a good old sing. I just love the magpie warble. They make such a complex noise when they warble. Um, I, I just don't know how they manage to do it. Um, they have other noises, of course, but um, it's that warble that I, I just think is gorgeous. Okay, so now we're over to a wetland. This is at the Landing Lights wetland. The, there are two herons here. I find Fascinating is how successful they are in catching food. They, nearly every time they put their head down, they pick up a worm or a grub or something, and you, you can see the little grub in their beak. Incredibly efficient. They must, their eyes must be amazing to be able to see. They're not just stabbing randomly. The light at this time of the day, the end of the day, was just perfect. Here is um, a little egret at the same place. There are three types of egrets, a little egret, 
a great egret and a medium egret. <laughs> um, an egret has, you can see, pretty much the same beak, the same sort of long legs, but it uses a very different kind of feeding tactic. It doesn't go for the little worms. It goes for bigger things like a fish, and it has, it's a lot more patient. It has to stand there for a lot longer uh, and get something a little bit bigger. Now, watch closely at what it's doing with its legs. This astounded me. Now it's shaking one leg in front of it. I assume that it, what the egret is doing is stirring up the bottom and hoping that something will swim out from the, the, the silt and it, which it can grab. I was I, I didn't I don't think I noticed it at the time. I think I noticed it when I got back and looked at it on the video on the computer. Unfortunately I didn't capture it successfully getting a fish or anything else. Definitely not as successful in this video anyway as the herons, even though it looks very similar. It's about the same size. They're very patient. They just stand there motionless a lot of the time. Suddenly it's got a neck. <laughs> well, here, here are the old uh, bin chickens, white ibises. Uh, we all know these. What was interesting I thought about this was they are doing a courtship ritual. This is at Cup and Saucer Creek. And this pair were doing the synchronized, the synchronized movements, bobbing their head up and down. It's not, nice to see them in a natural habitat, not rummaging through rubbish in wheelie bins. Every now and then a third ibis would come over and join in with this synchronized movement and, and was not welcomed. It was uh, chewed away. So this, uh, this pair of lovers could uh, continue with their ritual. Here, here are some more ibises. What, what um, I wanted to point out here is they're, they're in a natural environment and you can see why they've, how they've evolved with their shape, their long beak and their long legs and their long toes. It's for this kind of swampy environment. They can wade through very soft ground because they've got big long toes and they can poke down deep into the mud with their long beak. Um, they must be very intelligent, I think, to be able to adapt to a completely different city environment um, and thrive the way they thrive. Nothing unusual about seagulls, except I was able to see what they're doing. This is after rain, and you can see that they are also grabbing lots of worms. And um, again, it was something I, I didn't really see until I looked at the the video afterwards and saw up close that they were catching something. Just about every time they um, stick their beak down. And again, they, they must have incredible eyesight. I've noticed magpies the same. How do they see these worms in the grass? Now it's baby time. 
more corellas. These are corellas, this, this uh, flock of corellas who've made uh, their base around uh, Wardell Road at the, the, uh, where it crosses the Cooks River. <laughs> and this is a, a parent feeding the babies. And I love the, the tenderness of the, the parents. They're just, they're doting on the babies, preening them. Very tenderly. Even though the babies are just as big as the parents. Again, there's another parent gently looking after the baby, cleaning under the wing. Another baby, a grey butcher bird. And the mother comes in with some food. But this time the mother eats it itself, it doesn't give it to the baby. The baby seems to know, oh, I'm not getting something this time. There's the baby. Butcher birds very hard to spot, but, but you hear them all the time. When you when you know the call, you notice it very frequently. They're really hard to see. They they're obviously high in the foliage of trees. They're smaller than a magpie, but similar in appearance. Oh, and the tawny frogmouse. Everyone seems to love tawny frogmouths. This is a family of tawnies um, at, at Boat Harbour. So many people passing by seem to know they're there and look, looked up to at them. So we've got here on the nest a mother and two babies. And if you don't know about tawnies, they normally sit like a statue, not moving at all. And they, their colouring makes them blend in with the bark and they're really hard to see. But look what's going on when they have babies in the nest. Worming, wriggling. It just, <laughs> just won't sit still. I wonder what the mother thinks about this. So, well, it could be the father, whatever the whoever the parent is. There's a, the second one on the right there. Just <laughs> the parent has to constantly readjust as they squirm about. <laughs> and exercise their wings. Get comfortable. Coming up to the breeding season now, um, I haven't, haven't checked what they're up to, so have a look if you're going by. In the 
Katarina trade. More babies, dusky moorhens. These are so cute. I just love the way that the mother is feeding them. She's picking out little pieces of greenery and she's a bit selective about what she gives them and, and just pops it in their beak. You can't see is there were the least a half a dozen of others that, that are not in the frame they were bobbing around just outside they're just little fluff balls the mother's just working non-stop feeding these little babies species but the same sort of behavior. A Eurasian coot, same thing. This is a Tempe wetlands. Same thing. Pick, finding some choice bits of greenery and gently feeding it to the baby. doing this for ages just all, all the whole time I was there the mother was feeding the baby I would be very hungry the these um birds have got an interesting foot structure they, they don't have a webbed foot it's it's uh, they've got um webbing on each toe that is not joined to the next toe. This seems to be like a hybrid webbed foot. Okay, over to landing light wetlands again. And that's the only place around, well, that I know apart from Homebush Bay in Sydney where we have black wing stilts. And this is a, a parent. Not a baby. It's making a lot of noise because I think it's not happy about me being nearby its baby. Show you next. Stilts are just oh, exquisite looking birds. They have long legs like chopsticks and long pointy beak. And this is a baby. Very similar, just the beak is not just as long, different colour plumage. And you can hear the parent in the background being protective. I think they're just gorgeous. The water here is perf the perfect depth for them. They don't, can't see how long their legs are here, but they must, must be about nearly 30 centimetres long, something like that. And we've got some more fluff balls, swamp hens. This is in the Cup and Saucer Creek. You can see their huge feet. These are fluff balls on legs. Their legs just seem too big for them. And that's one of the adults there. They've got bits of green duckweed on them from the water. And this is the parent 
I just thought like it has hiccups. I'm sure it's not hiccups, but it's repetitive walk is a bit like hiccups. To the river. So this is baby fish that I am guessing are mullet. They're, they'd be very tiny, less than the size of a finger. And they're all gulping at the surface. And I, I, I don't know why. Um, it's interesting behavior I haven't seen before. I know mullets always um, swim just under the surface, but I don't I've never noticed them actually breaking the surface like this. They, they, I, I'm just guessing that they're feeding on something there that we can't see. But it's a pretty common sight in the river. There are, there are always lots of mullet in the river. The Cooks River is an estuary and estuaries are breeding areas for all sorts of fish. There's no animals in this, it's just interesting moment where the fog, there's a slight mist on the river has been captured in the sunlight and uh, drifting along the river, I thought it was really special. Let's go for, back for a moment there. If you watch it on the left, there's a birds flying in and breaking the mist apart. This was on the, I think the Illawarra Road bridge. It was filmed on a phone. If you're ever trying to film or photograph this or fog, film it with the sun coming towards you like this. When you're behind it, you just don't get that effect. Back over to Boat Harbour. And it's the litter collection boom. And it's very commonly full of birds sitting on it. It's a, it's a safe spot for them to rest away from predators. Um, safe from people, safe from dogs, safe from cats, maybe even foxes. So places like that are important for these large birds. So if you go back and have a look, they're, they're all big birds. They're not the kind of birds that sit in a tree. If you, 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 you couldn't imagine a pelican landing into a big bushy tree. Its wings and bill, um, bill would get caught. They like to be in open spaces. So here's another place where they like to gather. This is Fatima Island over near the Princess Highway at low tide. So there's a bit of um, the island shown. So in this one video, we've got at least four different species of bird, a little cormorant, black cormorant, um, I've forgotten the others, pelican, and there was one other. Um, yeah, sorry, great cormorant. And they're using it, they're using it to dry themselves and to be able to do that 
away from predators. They, when they're drying themselves, they're vulnerable. They can't fly as well as they would like to, I'm sure. Um, so these sort of places are important for, for them to have. But this is Fatim Island at high tide. There's very little to see, obviously. Um, but even with a branch poking up, that's being used. A little black corner. Bases at a premium. Little, these little black cormorants uh, usually gather in large flocks. You can sometimes see them coming down the river in groups of 20 or more, 40 or 50 sometimes. And they work, they just they cover the width of the river. And I, I, I think their strategy is that someone is always scaring fish somewhere so that it, wherever you are you're going to get a fish swimming in your direction at some point. The birds and the bees but not what you're thinking. This is literally bees so this is western honeybees or European honeybees and this is just near Illawarra Road just next to the south of the park. In fact, probably about one and a half metres off the cycle path, and you wouldn't know it's there unless you go and look at it. You can see with some of these bees, they're, they've got yellow legs, they've got the, the pollen stuck to their legs. And it's like a busy airport. Constant coming and going of bees as they're Busily collecting pollen. But I, I've come back a few times and I, I've noticed on some days they, they don't operate at all. On, on a cold, damp day, they you just they're just not there. And I thought, oh no, they've gone, but no, they they're just staying indoors. <laughs> now Crabs. This is just a little video I filmed on my phone and watch crab in the middle. Look at that. It's raising its claws. And that, that is a semaphore crab. That's, very, that's a, a definitive behavior of this crab called a semaphore crab. And until I looked into this, I just called them all mud crabs. But there are quite a few different species of, of crabs that can be in this river mud. And these ones, um, they have do this behavior, but it's not clear what it is they're doing. They, they could be signaling to a mate or they could be warning off uh, another, you know, other males. Um, no, it's just a bit of a mystery at the moment. If you go looking for crabs, which I did, I, f I was surprised at how few areas of the river actually have crabs. I, until I looked properly, I didn't realize that there are only a small number of areas with, with crabs in them. I don't know why. Now here is a, something very special for, for me anyway, um, a sacred kingfisher. And I've put it after the crabs because their favorite meal seems to be crabs. I haven't got images uh, in this video of eating. They're very skittish. They fly off whenever you come near. Really beautiful colouring. So there, there are, there's at least one pair down um, near the junction with Walleye Creek. Um, there may be another pair, I'm not sure. But, um, and if you want to look for them, 
you need to go at a low tide because that is when the mud is exposed and that's when the crabs are exposed and crabs are what, what they uh, go for. I, I've never seen a kingfisher before. I was really excited to see it. I was surprised how small they are. They, they look, they're a kingfisher like the kookaburra is also a kingfisher. Um, but they must be about half, about half the height of a, of a kookaburra. Now here are some more shots from Dave Noble and you can see a kingfisher with a crab just about to go down. These are just, he's got lots of wonderful shots of kingfishers. Here we go. He's, and I'm pretty sure it's a semaphore crab, one of the ones I just showed before. He's bashing it on a branch just to soften it up a bit. Getting in the right position. Smashing it a bit more. I think he's knocking off the, the claws. <laughs> Smashing it a bit more and down the hatch. <laughs> you wonder, how does it deal with all those shells and hard bits on crabs? Well, the answer is they regurgitate them. <laughs> they regurgitate these pellets and Dave's got these fantastic shots of the, the pellets coming out. <laughs> there it is falling down. Okay, now we're down at Gough Whitlam Park, and this is another bird that I was just really excited to see, a bowerbird. I've never seen a bowerbird until now, and I was just amazed that they could be around the Crooks River. Um, and for, for those who don't know, bowerbirds are the ones that collect blue objects. Here we go, he's got a very special blue bottle top. And there, so I don't know anything about bowerbirds except other experts have told me that these are um, juvenile males. There's a group of them. And they must be just practicing their collection skills for blue objects. And they, when they're adults, they scatter blue objects around their nest to, to attract the females, I assume. They're not there at the moment. So it's just wonderful that they have come down to Gough Whitman Park and made it their base for a little while. Flying foxes. This is a Walleye Creek. There's a flying fox encampment there summer uh, well even from now you can see the flying foxes every evening leaving walleye creek flying across the suburbs i was really hoping to capture a baby on video but i haven't so far it's one of my things i want to do Make sure I'm wearing a hat when I'm below these guys because there are things dripping down from them. This is a striated heron um, at uh, Boat Harbour at the little bird sanctuary. They're not, uh, not easy to see, they're off there, there are not many around. But I have repeatedly seen a heron at this same spot and they look like they have no neck at all. But they do have a bit of a neck. 
I think, yeah, there we go. Oh, just for a moment, he pokes his neck out. <laughs> Keep moving because we're still a bit to go. More black wing stilts. You can see their long legs a bit more. Just beautiful birds. I've never seen what it is that they're eating. I'll keep moving. And beautiful rainbow lorikeets. And what's interesting here is you can see the tongue there slurping up the nectar. I've never seen that until I had my own video footage. Licking each flower. And kookaburra. I really wanted to catch this kookaburra laughing. It was laughing its head off. I came over, I set my camera up and it stopped. And I packed my camera up and I walked, started walking away and it started laughing again. And now I've at the, the back of my house, there are a couple of kookaburras nearly every morning. They start laughing and I've rushed out there. My neighbor Pete has seen me rushing out there, setting up my tripod and camera. And as soon as I get there, they stop. And I've never <laughs> still haven't caught them laughing. So that's another challenge for me. I just thought this was interesting to see the, the difference between feeding techniques. Again, we've got the spoon bill, the lovely broad bill. I have to do the sideways head movements versus the heron that does the, the stabbing motion. Seen before, I'll keep moving. And here we've got ducks and they're just sticking their bottoms up in the air every time they reach down to get food. So at times all you can see is bottoms up. there and this is a this is the great egret you can see how big it is compared to the little egret keep moving and I think this is the last video got some lovely wood ducks You can hear a willy wag, willy wag tail in the background. And then coming past the penguin, you can see, you know, the lunging technique now. I thought I'd finish with some things that I've learned um, in the process of taking all these videos. So one is that I realised a lot of people love seeing wildlife and nature, and it really pleases me. It's not just me who enjoys this. There are lots of people who, who just get a thrill out of seeing local wildlife. They don't normally see it because they don't have um, the right camera or binoculars. And there's just a, there's always just a great response whenever um, whenever they, whenever I post something on the Facebook page or share some, share it, just tell someone what I've seen. Uh, next thing I've learned is that I, I think this is a, an opinion, but I think nature, having close access to nature, improves the livability of the area for people. It's it's not just for animals, but for people. I think we all, you know, we see it in these days with the lockdown. People are just outdoors as much as possible. They're craving to be amongst nature. 
um, whatever there is. Unfortunately, in the inner west, it has the second, the, in, the, L, the inner west LGA has the second lowest amount of open space per person out of all the LGAs in Sydney. So whatever space we have is precious. So the third thing is that people love hearing about local nature, even if they don't see it themselves. And I, I think that it's big for, for a number of reasons. One is that it's, it's, it's a sign of a healthy river and a healthy environment. And it also says to people that, well, okay, the river is worth looking after. There are all these animals living in it. It's not just a, a drain like it used to be treated 50 years ago for, for waste. And it gives people hope for the future. I, I keep hearing people say, wow, the river is really improving. It's, it's showing signs of um, wildlife just makes people realise, yeah, we can make a change. We can make it improve. Next thing I've realised is that green space is not necessarily river habitat. When I go looking for birds and other animals, they are rarely in lawn, on lawns like this. They are always in wetlands or bush, mangroves, places like that. They need not just green space. Green space is what humans like, but it's not habitat for frogs or lizards or insects. And they're all things that birds feed on and other animals, of course. So it's not a place for uh, biodiversity. And when, when I sort of realised that, I realised there's a lot more room for native habitat if we try. So there are so many places like this where it's the edge of a playing field and it's not used for anything. Um, it could easily fit in um, more um, native plants and so on. Um, and it would make it beautiful. It wouldn't just be good for animals. It would be great for people too. So here's an example. This is Timbrel Park in, in Five Dock. And in, in the middle, you can see all that um, vegetation that's, that's um, you know, would normally just be open space. And I've circled there on the right, a cricket pitch. It's a bit hard to see. Um, so that's a cricket field. And what's interesting is where the second circle is, that is a, just seems to be a, a bunch of um, vegetation that's been put there. And I can only assume it's, it's just to break up the, um, the field and provide a bit of habitat. So it shows that even a cricket field can have something like that just off the centre and, and not destroy the game. So if we really start thinking about it, there are lots of ways to fit in more um, habitat without, without losing what's important to us. So here, here's an example that uh, the, the council is doing a lot more of. They're creating these little um, rain gardens and pockets of um, vegetated um, verges in where they can, instead of just where it used to be concrete. And of course, individuals are converting their own, the grassy verge into little bits of um, native vegetation. Uh, it's, you know, it's nice to look at, it's great for birds, um, it's good for bees with the flowers, and it's less for councils to mow as well. Just to finish off, all of this, um, watching the wildlife is something that everyone can do. But the first thing I suggest is to get yourself a pair of binoculars. And it's, it's just amazing what a pair of binoculars can do. It just, it's like having bionic vision. You can see so much more. Um, there are many brands. This is just one brand, it happens to be an Australian brand, but what you need to look for is the, the rating. So this 
you either go for an eight by 32 or an eight by 42. The eight is the, is the magnification. You don't want something that's too high magnification because it, any movement in your hands will make it too um, shaky. And the second digit, the 32, is it's about how much light gets into the lens. It's the size of the lens. Um, the smaller the number makes them lighter. So if you've got small hands, don't get a big pair because you'll just be too shaky again. Um, I've got eight by 42 and I'm quite happy with that. So I suggest that um, in, in the spirit of raising awareness of, of the, the river um, for yourself and amongst other people, try identifying what you see and photograph it and share it with others. It just helps sort of change the attitude of the river, of the whole environment, the local river. It's not just a, um, you know, a body of water with playing fields. They're actually, it's a corridor of wildlife and they depend on that, on all those local habitats to live. And lastly, I invite everyone to reimagine your local area and be a champion of native habitat. It could mean planting your own birch garden, but not everyone has that opportunity. There are local bush care groups like the mud crabs. Um, they have found a number of sites along the river uh, that were just unused, like embankments, and have converted them into native habitat. And contact your council if you see a spot that is just unused and is a great spot for um, vegetating, contact them, send them an email saying, you know, I really support this. They, they won't do things if the residents don't demand it. So that is it. I have really enjoyed this evening um, and I would be happy to take questions if there are any. Anika said that she'd noticed a lot of corellas and cockatoos recently around the river and also in Olsen Hillston Park neighbourhood. Why are they, oh, they, how come they seem to be sweeping a lot? Is it people feeding them? And Kay suggested they've been around for a while, lots of nesting hollows near Boat Harbour and Cup and Saucer Creek, also fed by people. Don't know they if are, you know about that. They are definitely fed by people, yes. There's a... I've noticed a man feeding them just near the Wardell Road bridge, uh, not just them, but a bunch of birds every morning. I don't know. I can't say anything more about them. I don't know anything about them. But, uh, yeah, something for you to investigate. Um, I've got a, a little question. I've noticed hmm. a, a huge increase in the number of magpies. Uh, I've got seven or eight magpies on my back lawn every morning singing and uh hopping up onto the deck and helping themselves to one of my dog biscuits um <laughs> and previously minor birds were doing that but there are magpies everywhere uh, uh, all over the place and i just wonder if anyone else has noticed that there seems to be a a really uh, bumper um crop of of magpies about at the moment interesting I, look, I, I have can't say i've noticed them more than normal um but that's really interesting Anne. Oh, there are definitely some around me, and I just love hearing them. And, I, and I've noticed with the shutdown and less traffic that I can hear them more than normal, which is just lovely. Um, yeah, well, good luck to them if there are, there's a bumper crop at the moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most of the rest of the discussion was about where, uh, where, where landing lights is exactly. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see yes. my cursor? Yep. So landing light wetlands is just here. It's very near the entrance to Cooks River, the beginning of Cooks River. Um, so I'll show you a few more of the place. So that's landing lights. Tempe wetlands is here. That's the junction of Walleye Creek there. And that's a beautiful walking track down there, very bushy. And maybe um, point out in Gough Whitlam where the bow bird and the... Yeah, so the bow... Bird was in here, and the kingfishers are around here. 
Cup and Saucer Creek is here. Yeah, they're, they're, the, they're the wetlands. Cup and Saucer Creek, uh, Gotham Park, Tempe Wetlands, and Landing Lights Wetlands. And oh, the Tawny Frogmouth. No yeah, they, they are up here at Boat Harbour. Whoop. Right there. So this is an interesting map because it shows the catchment of the Cooks River and you can see it's huge. It goes down to Hurstville, Penshurst, out to Yaguna, um, the Moor Park. Um, and it means that any, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but any rubbish on the streets in this whole area eventually funnels back into the Cooks River and that flows out into Botany Bay. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Martin. It was wonderful. There were lots and lots of comments uh, all through the chat, uh, all through your presentation, saying how much everyone enjoyed it and how wonderful it was to have this river near us. It was fabulous. Thanks, Martin. Thank you very much. It's wonderful.